when I when I'm asked about farm murders, for example, uh, I make you know my views clear that that's entirely wrong, uh, and it doesn't do South Africa any credit at all in in terms of its reputation or respect for the rule of law. I equally say to the movements um, that are you know seeking to campaign around that issue, why do you ally yourselves with former President Trump? and the old right in America, which is a racist force. Hi everyone, I'm Petrus and welcome to Worldview. Worldview is a podcast where we explore everyone's perspectives on all things that can broaden our worldview. If you watch some of our content so far and liked it, please consider liking this video, subscribing and donating on Patreon. Today we're talking with former British anti-apartheid leader Lord Peter Hayne. Lord Hayne, the son of South African-born anti-apartheid activists whose childhood was spent in Victoria, was a British MP for 24 years and served in the governments of Tony Blair and Gordon Brown for 12 years, seven in the UK cabinet. He has held positions like Secretary for Northern Ireland, Secretary of State for Wales and the leader of the House of Commons. Lord Hayne has authored 24 books such as his biography on Nelson Mandela and his personal memoirs. He's currently a member of the House of Lords. Lord Hain, welcome to the show. Delighted to be with you. It's an absolute honor to have you. And for those of you that you know very rarely might not know uh, who you are, could you just please, please give us a brief summary of your anti-apartheid struggles? Well, as you mentioned, Beatrice, I was brought up in Pretoria predominantly by South African-born parents. My mother born in Port Alfred, my dad in Durban. And they were very involved in the anti-apartheid struggle as leading members of the Liberal Party of South Africa in the early 1960s, especially when they were notorious in the seat of apartheid and forced into exile in 1966 after having been jailed and issued with banning orders. They stopped my dad working so we couldn't Mm -hmm. stay in the country uh, that we wanted. And then I became uh, involved in the anti-apartheid movement in Britain in the late 60s and led campaigns there. Mm. Well, you, you actually, could you give us some examples of exactly, you mentioned now that your family was targeted, your dad couldn't work at all. Could you ex- uh, give us some examples of some of the other more extreme actions that it took? For example, I know that they actually broke into your home, state security even sent you a letter bomb, and they were trying to get you convicted. Yes, yeah, so I was sent a letter bomb in June 1972 of the kind which killed anti-apartheid activists across the world. Ruth First, for example, Joe Slovo's wife, very prominent in the ANC, was killed in 1982 with the same kind of bomb. Fortunately, in my case, there was a fault in the trigger mechanism and it didn't go off, though uh, the police told me in London that it could have blown our family home to smithereens as well as killing me and my parents and uh, sisters and could also have have blown the house uh, to um, uh, to demolish the house. So it was a very powerful bomb uh, of the kind which, as I say, was lethal for other anti-apartheid leaders across the world. And then uh, uh, the most extraordinary thing that happened to me in 1975 was I was charged with committing a bank theft that I knew nothing about. (laughs) When the police arrived to arrest me, it was a very Orwellian, Kafkaesque like experience mm-hmm. of being arrested for something that I didn't know had even happened. And it turned out later that a South African agent, rather looking rather like me, had committed the bank theft, stealing money from a branch of Barclays Bank out, outside of which I demonstrated yeah. a few years previously against Barclays links with South Africa. And so uh, if I was acquitted, but it was a very unpleasant uh, experience. To say the least, I mean, I cannot imagine what that's like. I mean, especially the fact that it happened in the UK. It's not even a South African-bound scenario. Um, Was it perhaps pinned on you uh, by South African Asians? Or uh, how exactly did they uh, indict you specifically? Well, it's a complicated story, but it's essentially a South African agent, as I say, resembling me, robbed this bank, was chased by bank staff, and then threw the money back, a rather odd thing to do for the police, uh, for a... a rather odd thing to do for the for a thief and i was then implicated afterwards uh, when i actually i drove back past even more bizarrely drove past the uh, the pursuers 
who were taking the money back to the bank. I knew nothing about what had gone on and parked right next to them. Mm. And I was, uh, the next thing I knew, I was arrested for something I, I didn't even know had happened. And it went for a two-week trial in Britain's Old Bailey, the top criminal court in the land. I was acquitted, uh, but it was very difficult and, and a horrible thing to, to have happen to me uh, because um, once the, the state of identification evidence at the time, it was, was since reformed, partly as a result of my case, which became very well known, uh, that once somebody points the finger on you, uh, at you, it's very difficult to say, to prove your innocence. If somebody says, that's him, uh, once they've done that, it's very difficult to, to prove your innocence. And there were all sorts of bizarre things about it. Clearly, there was collaboration in the background between the South African Security Service, called BOSS, the Bureau of State Security at the time, and British intelligence, and uh, evidence came out about that. And the police were anxious to convict me, as one of them told me whilst I was being held prior to my charge. He said, you've caused a lot of trouble in your time with protests, and we're determined to make sure this sticks on you. So it was pretty transparent what their motivation was. Yes, that, that's exactly what connects it to the Orwellian experience. It's just they, they didn't really care about the crime. They were out to get you specifically, which makes it just so much more personal and, and intense. Um, I want to talk a bit about uh, of the work you did. Uh, specifically, you testified, um, testified uh, at the Zondo Commission. Could you perhaps give us a summary about that situation? Very happy to. Uh, I testified in November 2019 before the Zondo Commission about the international dimension to state capture and corruption under former President Zuma and his business associates, the Gupta brothers. I was asked to do that, and I was asked to expose that international dimension, the money laundering of the proceeds of their systematic looting of billions of rent, of laundered and then laundered out through banks like HSBC, Bank of Baroda, and Standard Charter Bank, all of which had admitted to having uh, Gupta and Zuma accounts at the time. It was laundered through Dubai and Hong Kong in the main, and sometimes came back into the country and was spent by the Guptas on all sorts of illicit and nefarious purposes, including a, uh, a wedding ceremony in Sun City, uh, where taxpayers' money was lavishly spent. But um, the point of my intervention, and I was asked to do this by people seeking to stop the state capture and corruption and to bring down President Zuma, which they eventually succeeded in doing, I was asked to do it because the story was well known to South Africans after investigative journalists, brave ones, exposed it in online media like the Daily Maverick, especially Amo Bugani and Scorpio and investigative journalists exposed all of that, as you know. But what was less known was the fact that they had, they had, the Guptas in particular, had worked with international corporates, not just those three banks, HSBC, Standard Chartered and Bank of Baroda, by the way, all with offices in London, Okay. and global operations, but that uh, KPMG, McKinsey, Bain & Co, SAP, the law firm Hogan, Hogan Lovells, they were all complicit mm -hmm. as well. And so telling the story under parliamentary privilege uh, with information supplied to me by brave South African whistleblowers inside the system, uh, telling that story to under parliamentary privilege in the House of Lords meant that it was reported on the front pages of the Financial Times in London, the Global newspaper, and also the New York Times. And so the story went global. And once that happened, these global corporates who'd been complicit in the whole looting and corruption because they'd received fees for from the Guptas and others involved, um, once that the story went global. These global corporates felt the heat in New York and London, in Berlin and Paris and uh, elsewhere. And that is when they began to 
take action, dismiss the South African management had been complicit, and in some cases promising to pay the money back that they had had in enormous fees. Bell Pottinger was another one of these global uh, corporates, a British-based public affairs company that, of course, uh, organized a racist a campaign of disinformation, of falsehoods and fake news on behalf of the Guptas and, and the Zoomers to, to target critics of the state capture and corruption. But as I say, the value to those who asked me to do it and supplied me with the insider information uh, to expose this in, in London was that the story then ceased to be a domestic South African story, but became a global one. Uh, and I was able to undertake that task and deliver the deliver it successfully. And, and I, I'm told that it helped bring down President Zuma, uh, and certainly I, I hope so. And it's 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 amazing because there really is a um, almost want to say a disconnect between South Africans who know the story so incredibly well and their knowledge of the outside involvement of the scenario because it really cannot be done. The money laundering cannot really be done by banks only within South Africa. It had to be taken outside. So um, exposing it to the international market not only um, made them realize that they were implicit as well, but also made South Africa realize that the story was way bigger than just their borders. In what way do you think is do you think that the the exposure itself was enough, or do you think that perhaps um, you know just just calling them out on it will be enough to prevent this type of involvement in the future, or do you think some sort of regulation should exist in the way that these amount of funds are transferred between banks internationally and locally? How how exactly can we prevent this from happening again? It's a very good question, Beatrice, and the answer is very complicated. Okay. The Zoomers and the Guptas would not have been able to do this without the banks allowing them to transfer their money internationally. And the Guptas have been spending it like there's no tomorrow in India and Dubai, uh, including uh, the other, I think about 18 months ago, on a lavish wedding for two of their sons. Uh, very lavish. Now, they would not have been able to get their money out. They didn't carry it out in brown paper bags or in suitcases in cash. They, it went through the international digital pipelines of financial institutions globally and was then um, diverted in all sorts of nefarious ways. And what I found in engaging with these banks in particular uh, but all of the um, the institutions and global corporates involved, the banks were in denial about their own um, complicity. They admitted to holding Gupta accounts. They uh, they said that they admitted to the money going out of Johannesburg in the main. But then they said, well, it's nothing to do with us. What happened to it? Well, frankly, that is not acceptable. I remember engaging in an argument with exec Johannesburg executives of Standard Chartered who said, well, it's nothing to do with them, that they sent the money, the Gupta money, to Dubai. It went to a standard chartered branch in Dubai, just as it left their Johannesburg branch. It's the same international bank, but they claim they couldn't be responsible for what happened to it after it entered J Dubai's jurisdiction. That is not good enough. They have to accept their own responsibility, indeed their culpability. Um, and the same goes for their operations in Hong Kong or London, for that matter, or anywhere else in the world, because this is South African taxpayers' money, masses and masses of it. It should have been spent on better schools, on better health care, on creating jobs for much needed jobs for unemployed uh, black South Africans in the main. And uh, it was very interesting to see the response that, that, that uh, my revelations in the British Parliament attracted from the Zoomers and the Guptas and the, particularly their their empire, the Bell Pottinger machine of social media yeah. mischief and disinformation and bots and the rest of it, because they then started attacking me. They started attacking me as a, a almost white colonial figure. Uh, awesome. But what they had, you know, they, they couldn't easily do that to me because I'm from South Africa. Mm -hmm. I had a I had a record in the anti-apartheid movement. I led campaigns to stop all white Springbok tours and succeeded in stopping them through uh, invading the pitch. Uh, but that's another story. So, you know, and I risked my life was endangered um, and, and I was charged with something. And then I was also charged in 1972 with a conspiracy case funded from South Africa. 
private prosecution. So, you know, um, it's not like I didn't have credentials in the anti-apartheid struggle. It was very difficult for the Zoomers and the Guptas to, as it were, caricature me as a, yeah. as a foreign lord interfering in South Africa's affairs. By the way, exactly the same charge that was directed at um, uh, people like me by South Africa, white South African apartheid supporters at the time for interfering in South African affairs from Britain. It's interesting how the same, the very same language was used yeah. by the Zoomers and the Guptas. Yeah, no, exactly. It's, it, that we'll, we'll actually get to that shortly in the scenario of how it feels like the pendulum has kind of swung to the other side and seeing how that plays out. But first of all, I want to talk about you said that in some cases, some of these organizations promise to pay back the money. I mean, this, this is from a South African perspective, like a, you know, a pipe dream. It's, it's something that would be amazing, but we just simply don't believe it to be possible. Do you think that there's any possibility of us getting a taxpayer money back and put into worthwhile causes locally? Well, as I understand it, McKinsey and uh, KPMG, the, the global corporate consultancies involved in this and who admitted their culpability when it was exposed, not before it was exposed, they promised to pay their fees back. Well, that's fine. I don't know whether that's actually happened or to what extent, if so. Uh, but that's fine. But actually, that's a pinprick compared with the billions looted. And that money is still controlled by the Guptas and some of the Zoomers. And it hasn't been recovered. It could be recovered by a forensic accountants and asset recovery specialists, but that would require, and I put proposals to the South African Treasury and to South African ministers to do this, uh, but they've not so far been able to agree, not because they don't want to get the money back, but because it's a novel way of doing it. Okay. The Nigerian government has employed these very same asset traces as I have recommended to the South African, to South African ministers very successfully. They've got lots, hundreds of millions of dollars back of over a billion that was uh, stolen in oil related money in the main. The Nigerians have been able to do that. I don't really know why it hasn't been done in South Africa yet. Yeah, well, um, I mean, it's actually interesting you talk about this as a novel approach I mean, in ways that you know, you fought the anti-apartheid era with the methods that were available you with for you at the time, and now you're being targeted with the same type of language that you were targeted back then um, by the apartheid era government. In the same way, the Bell Potter scenario is something that's quite uh, interesting, at least for me to anal analyze, because at my university in our research department, uh, we work quite closely with uh, members of the Daily Maverick who um, exposed the uh, bot network. Uh, that um, that Bell Pottinger created, uh, the white monopoly capital bot network, to shine, you know, sow a ton of disinformation among the general populace of South Africa and turn the public sentiment against them. And they exposed that entire network. So this is also a novel way of changing the discussion. You know, this is obviously something that wasn't possible without social media beforehand. How do you stay on top of all of these type of developments, both as a way of attacking causes uh, sorry, it's attacking the cause of trying to dismantle this entire corrupt scheme um, and of the ones that at the same time you have to employ to get the money back. So how do you stay on top of these changes in technology and tactics? Is, is it always like a give and take? Uh, how do you do it? <laughs> well, I, look, I'm, I'm the person who has, I, I, did, I didn't find the evidence myself. It was provided to me, as I say, by, by whistleblowers uh, and when I was asked to undertake this task in the British Parliament, I asked for, I said, look, I don't have the capacity, I'm, I'm me on my own. I don't have any staff or any resources to investigate. I, I needed drafts of speeches, carefully researched and, and, and uh, backed up to, to do it. Similarly, I don't have the, the expertise or capability to, um, to trace them, the, the stolen funds by the Guptas and, and the Zoomers. Uh, but the South African, uh, the South African authorities uh, would be able to employ experts, forensic accounting experts and asset tracing lawyers if they chose to, to do so. And they've been handed a proposition by myself in order to, to do that. So you asked me, um, 
how to do it. I, I don't have the expertise to do it. And indeed, when I gave my evidence to the Zondo Commission, which was very detailed about the reforms needed in the international financial system to stop this kind of money laundering, I had the assistance of experts in the field who voluntarily helped uh, me submit my evidence. And then, you know, subsequently, I, I gave oral evidence in front of the in inquiry after I think a 10,000 word document of submission. So it's others who are expert in the field. I'm, I'm the politician who, who can, uh, as it were, ventilate it and seek to pressure the authorities internationally to make changes that are necessary. And without those changes, I mean, there's corruption going on in South Africa at the moment. Yes. We've seen examples. Um, the arrest of the, uh, uh, the Secretary General of the ANC, uh, Ace Magashuli, former Free State um, Premier, uh, is an example of that. And there are other examples happening almost daily. So the, the, the cancer is still in the system, but the big villains, the Zoomers and, and the Guptas, at least have been taken out of action. No, exactly. Um, so I want to talk to us, uh, pivot this slightly about um, comparing the scenario of the anti-apartheid movement internationally to solving the apartheid problem to what happened afterwards. So uh, an example that I have is, for example, I think the Bush administration in the US is quite often um, used an example that they uh, got involved in Iraq and Saddam Hussein, and they, they tried to solve the, the problem there, the um, the oppression and, and the type of terrorist actions that came from that part of the world. And then after they kind of solved it in terms of they invaded and they removed the government there, they weren't interested in what came afterwards. They, they weren't involved in the peace and make, making sure that the buildup of a stable, you know, a safe environment that's a democratic environment uh, in that country afterwards. And they have the same scenario in South Africa at the moment, at least if you'll allow me to make this comparison. Um, that there really it's an odd, isn't an odd comparison to make, Beatrice, but I'll let you make it. Yes, of course. Yeah, no. In, in the way that I make the comparison is that it's a very public, common concept of being involved in trying to solve the problem, but not being involved in the um, building up process afterwards. And this is the same way in South Africa, where we have uh, we had insane international support to get rid of the apartheid era um, by a lot of international, um, uh, you know, yourself, for example, a lot of international par parties. But then there was no international pressure now on South Africa to remove the ideas of expropriation or other compensation and the ANC's continued corruption. Not no, rather, but sorry, a much lesser degree thereof than there was in removing anti apartheid era. Why do you think people are not involved in maintaining the peace that they fought so hard to get? Well, I don't, I don't as I indicated, I don't accept that there's an analogy with uh, Iraq or you can say Libya, another disastrous um foreign intervention to deal with a dictator, but actually leaving a bigger problem behind. Okay. Uh, but that's a whole different discussion and a very different one to the South African one. In the international anti-apartheid movement, including, and it was led basically by Oliver Tambo, the president of the ANC in exile fr from London, and other South African exiles, black and white, uh, who'd been forced to leave the country that they loved. Uh, at, you know, that was a, a big battle. And we were a minority. We were a minority in Britain. We were a minority elsewhere in the world where anti-apartheid movements were organized. And we had, we were up against the, 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 the international financial and economic system, which traded with South Africa, armed, armed apartheid. Uh, and basically allowed the apartheid state to prosper. So it was a battle against that as much as it was to support the internal resistance uh, that built up to crescendo in the 1980s. And once um, apartheid had been overthrown and replaced by a democratically elected majority government for the very first time in South Africa's entire history, uh, under Nelson Mandela in April 1994, then it was the duty of the international um, community to deal with South Africa as another democratic country and not to seek to, uh, as it were, seek to intervene in its affairs in a way that was necessary 
uh, to get rid of apartheid. So, okay, there's lots of things happening in South Africa at the moment, in, in predominantly the corruption that I don't, uh, that, that I deplore, and I've tried to do something about it at the request of, of, of South African citizens. Um, and supported, I think, by the majority in South Africa. But when, when you come to policies like uh, land reform and so on, I really don't think it's for us to second guess a South African government decision. We can have our own opinion about it. And right. uh, I have expressed opinions about the particular model of land reform. And I think it's very important to redistribute land. But I think it's Im equally important to retain foreign investor confidence and to do um, that land reform domestically in South Africa in a fair and equitable way as well. So, you know, it's that kind of thing that uh, I would comment upon. But I don't think you can say that we <laughs> that we can mobilize a, an anti-apartheid type equivalent mm. to deal with a very complex question that needs addressed for historic reasons of injustice. To then say, well, there needs to be a global movement. Um, and I don't, for that reason, accept the comparison with Iraq or Libya or, or Afghanistan for that moment, which are very different scenarios where Western governments went in to try and sort out a bad situation and ended up, in many respects, making it worse. Well, thank you so much. It's an incredibly insightful uh, perspective, and I really, really appreciate you sharing it. I think it's quite important for a lot of South Africans that feel perhaps that you know this problem um, might need foreign involvement to realize first that it's a domestic issue that we have to address. Uh, though there are some that would feel that some of the scenarios where violent expropriation uh, by, by citizens that's not um, condoned by the government at all uh, would like to be given, say, for example, refugee status in another country or something of that scenario. So it might be that to a lesser degree they want international support. But I do agree with you in the sense that it's it's not you know a massive involvement uh, of a foreign involvement. It's, it's not an equivalent, uh, Pierre, just that's, yes. that's my point. But you mm. equally make a fair point. When, I, when I'm asked about farm murders, for example, mm. uh, I make you know, my views clear that that's entirely wrong. Mm. Uh, and it doesn't do South Africa any credit at all in, in terms of its reputation or respect for the rule of law. I equally say to the movements um, that are, you know, seeking to campaign around that issue, why do you ally yourselves with former President Trump and the alt-right in America, which is a racist force? And they do. They always tag in their tweets. Uh, they did, uh, Donald J. Trump, uh, when he was allowed on Twitter, uh, and other, other, other right-wing forces. If they want to mobilize broad support for their cause, and they have a case to do so. But if they want to do that, then they need to mobilize broad support, not ally themselves with racist forces abroad, which make a lot of people, me included, very suspicious of what their real motivation is. No, that's that's a very, very fair point. Thank you. Um, I want to pivot it over to another uh, project that you're incredibly passionate about, which is a huge problem we have in South Africa and, frankly, in the rest of Africa as a whole. And that is the problem of rhino poaching. I know you've written a book about this, which we'll definitely link in the description. Um, but how serious is the problem of rhino poaching for those that may not be fully familiar with it? Rhino poaching is very serious, especially in South Africa, which has one of the largest populations of rhino anywhere in the world, including the rest of Africa. And it's really at the front line. It's, it's, a, it's a war zone about whether this majestic uh, regal animal will be extinct or not. And the thing that I exposed in my thriller, The Rhino Conspiracy, was that this is not just about local poachers, the, the often unemployed poor guys on the front line, who shouldn't be excused at all for the evil deeds that they're committing to chopping off rhino horns. But it's not just them. They're at the bottom of a big international syndicate or syndicates that are based on this corruption, serious criminals involved, often with the help of corrupt politicians the world over, who give them shelter and allow them to continue their trade and get kickbacks as a result. Mm -hmm. So this is a big problem of international crime on the scale of drug trafficking and people trafficking and high organized international corruption. And so what my message is, and let, to deal with the threat to rhinos and uh, elephants, 
and many other uh, wild, many other wild animals. Um, there's a lot of uh, poaching of tigers and, and lions and leopards and cheetahs at the moment as well, and pangolin and, and others. If you want to really get to grips with this, you've got to deal with it on an international basis. It's a bit like the um, the problems of, of the Gupta Zuma uh, corruption and state capture. Ultimately, this is not just a South African problem because it is it is people who want the powder from ground down rhino horns or the ivory from uh, elephant tusks um, that pay exorbitant amounts of money. I mean, the the money they were paying for rhino horns up until the rise in the gold price was actually worth more than gold. Um, so wow. it's 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 big money involved here, and and the the local guys who go in with their pangas and their their AK forty sevens to attack these rhinos are, are not the main culprits. Uh, it's the international criminals, and actually even even more culpable in many ways. It's like you know you wouldn't have the drugs trade internationally if people didn't take drugs. Yeah, you wouldn't have the threat to rhinos. If there weren't in East Asia, especially China and Vietnam, but other countries in that region and some in America as well, who use the powder for all sorts of nefarious purposes as a drug substitute, um, as a, a, a as a kind of an aphrodisiac, yes, uh, or, or a party drug. I mean, what they are doing with that ground down rhino powder is actually themselves helping kill these animals so yeah. my, my rhino conspiracy thriller which came out um last september and uh is coming out in paperback um in in the next in the next few months including in south africa published by jonathan ball that exposes all of all of that picture and i hope people read it if they care about animals but also it is linked to the corruption we've been talking about because the poaching and corruption go hand in hand. Yeah, no, absolutely. And we've had a movement in South Africa. I mean, you, it's it's so it's so commonplace in South Africa to see people with uh, small red uh, plastic rhino horns on the front of their cars as a way to get um, you know people to, to to know about the situation, to care about the situation, get them involved. So that there's really a bigger discussion that's going on. But one of the misconceptions that is on the public scale is that they kind of feel like it's a it's like a rhino poaching pyramid. You know, it's like there's a lot of poachers at the bottom that go in with their AK-47s and their pungas and they hunt these people down. But it kind of goes up and towards the syndicate. And there's this there's this triangle at the top is the one you need to target to solve the problem. But it isn't actually that simple as far as I understand from 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 your own words. I mean, it really is a syndicate that's a, a gigantic problem. It's not even a it's not even a pyramid. It's like a trapezoid. Like there's a massive uh, bar at the top that's also involved in this. How far up does this problem go? Uh, you know, what players are involved? Well, my, my political thriller actually involves the uh, a fictional sitting president of South Africa at the time and and his his security chief. Uh, it's, it's it's fiction. But, you know, no prizes for guessing who that figure might have been. Um, and it's it's been shown and documented that in other countries, Kenya, for example, but that's just one country you, you could pick out, politicians at a high level and public officials are the ones who turn a blind eye to the poaching or who turn a blind eye to the smuggling of the horns mm -hmm. out of... Um, out of Africa to East Asia in the main. So it is, it goes all the way to the top. And that's one of the reasons why it cannot be resolved. It cannot be, this problem of poaching cannot be beaten unless you do it on an international basis. And there's a great charity, campaigning charity called Save the Rhino. And there are charities to save the elephants as well. Uh, and they do great work. But ultimately, this has to be resolved at a governmental level. Um, and, and governments, instead of just signing up to international treaties like they do on endangered wildlife, um, actually need to take the action and clean up the corruption and clean up their own system of governance or, or, or nothing will be done about it. Now, this is amazing. So this is a practical way in uh, the best possible method that we can actually stop rhino approaching. And it needs, it needs to be attacked on multiple levels. But this is a very practical help in terms of how people, especially in South Africa, can lobby and, and you know, petition uh, their representatives uh, in, in parliament and so on and so forth to really care about this scenario. 
Um, yeah, I want... and not just South Africa, but actually every country in the world. Right. Because every, more or less every country in the world is involved either by not cooperating uh, with their fellow governments to stop this, or in the case of the Chinas and the Vietnams, actually being their their citizens being being the ones who who pay for the the rhino powder that funds these international syndicates. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, so I want to change it over a bit more, but discussion on forms of government. Uh, I think there's a fantastic video by um, it's a, a British a YouTuber called Jay Foreman, and he explains how the whole House of Lords works. And this is something that was very interesting to me because, of course, this is a relatively uh, even though our government is is somewhat based on on the British government uh, in the way it's it's it performs, um, we're very strange to the concept of the House of the Lords. And in his specific video, he a actually strange says, institution. <laughs> you know, for us at least, I mean, it's it's really is something strange. We've we we have kings in our country, but it's not tied to our um. You know, the, the, we have rather well, we have royalty in our country, but it's not tied in the way we, we, we our government performs. Um, anyways, in his specific video, he says that um, there is actually a very good function for the House of Lords in the terms of the fact that it reviews um, laws and policies that the House of Commons commissions before it, gets, it, it is approached. Uh, sorry, approved rather. I wanted to ask your specific opinion. What is your opinion on the House of Lords? And does do you think there's it needs a, a reform to the U.S. Senate model, or is it defined the way that it is now? No, I don't think it's it's uh, defensible as it is now. Okay. I mean, I was appointed to the House of Lords by my party leader. He asked me to go there, and I, and I was due to stand again at the 2015 election as an MP, MP for Neath, from where I'm speaking to you now in South Wales. Um, uh, and he asked me to go to the House of Lords, and my, I was totally shocked and astounded, and I said, but I don't agree with the place. I think it should be changed. He said, that's why I want you to go there. Okay. That was that was the Labour leader Ed Miliband who hoped to be Prime Minister. Of course, he didn't get to be Prime Minister because we lost that election in 2015. But I believe it should be elected on a system of proportional representation, representative of the whole of the United Kingdom. So, proportionate to the population, representatives from Wales, representatives from regions of England. Uh, Scotland and uh, and Northern Ireland, so long as Northern Ireland stays in the United Kingdom, or Scotland for that matter does, mm. because the UK is under constitutional threat at the moment. Mm. So that's what I think should happen. It should be an elected chamber rather like, as you say, the, the American Senate. I mean, I wouldn't go for that model, because the American system of governance is very different. They have a president uh, who is independently elected and so on. Mm. But there are lots of countries in the world with bicameral parliaments, two chamber parliaments, uh, Germany, for instance, Australia is another, there are many others. And so the House of Lords does, even in, exist, in its existing antiquated and somewhat idiosyncratic uh, form, does actually play a valuable role of scrutinizing and amending legislation from the House of Commons, even in a situation where there's a majority conservative government under Boris Johnson, We've been able, because there's no majority for any one party in the House of Lords, um, you have to come on cross-party support and the support of independent cross-benchers, as they're called. So there's Labour, Conservative, Liberal Democrats, and then there are cross-benchers, people who are not aligned to any party. If we want to get an amendment to a government bill, uh, then what we have to do is win the support normally of the Liberals and of also of the cross benches in order to achieve it. Similarly, the Conservative government can, it cannot carry its legislation unless there's widespread support. Now, in the end, because we're not an elected chamber, the House of Commons is prime. Yeah. It has constitutional primacy, as it should do. But we have played a, a, a very important role in amending legislation and uh, will continue to do that. But I think out the foundations of British democracy would be much firmer if the House of Lords was elected um, as well. So um, you've also mentioned the Labour Party in the recent local elections. They also lost quite a few uh, you know, points or other positions. Um, what exactly do you attribute this loss to in the recent election? And what would your advice be to the Labour leadership on how they can regain, um, you know, once again, regain power? Well, first of all, we've lost a lot of elections recently. Uh, we didn't 
Britain. This is at a UK level. Mm. And especially in England. I'll come back to Scotland and, and Wales, and Wales in particular. Um, but we, we didn't, we haven't won an election since Tony Blair won in 2005. Well, okay. So Gordon Brown, his successor as Labour Prime Minister, lost in 2010. Mm. Ed Miliband lost in 2015. Jeremy Corbyn lost twice in 2017 and 2019. And under Jeremy Corbyn, we had our worst result in 2019, just 18 months ago. Mm. Our worst result since 1935. It was a terrible result. Wow. And so it's against that background that, that Keir, ha uh, Keir Starmer is um, seeking to rebuild Labour's support. And he's made important strides. I mean, his predecessor, Jeremy Corbyn, was never seen as a prime ministerial of prime ministerial calibre. Mm -hmm. The average voter could not see him stepping across 10 Downing Street and doing the job. And that's one of the reasons why we lost so badly. There are other ones too. But the results um, last Thursday, from last Thursday's elections, were very mixed. I mean, we won an amazing victory in Wales for the Welsh Parliament, for instance. You probably haven't seen yeah. much coverage of that. Um, because most of the media coverage has been on the losses of the by-election that Labour had uh, he had held in Hartlepool, had held the constituency in Hartlepool for 50 years um, in, in a Labour so-called heartland, and we lost that to the Conservatives, and that created all the headlines. Actually, we won a series of mayoral elections in, uh, in England, the results of which were announced yesterday, so we did better than the media headlines might suppose, but we still didn't do anything like well enough to win the next general election under Keir Starmer. So that's his task against that background. So just for a bit of context, why would um, Jeremy Corbyn be elected as the leader of the party if he wasn't, um, uh, you know, prime ministerial material? Well, I think members of the party were pretty fed up with the, di the, the direction of the party and felt it had lost a lot of its roots. And Jeremy Corbyn appealed to those traditional values and enunciated policies of social justice and human rights uh, and uh, and greater equality. He, he did that very effectively, but he didn't really have a compelling program for government that added up. That was exposed in the last general election campaign, and, and nor did he appear to most people in the country, including Labour sympathisers, to be a potential prime minister. That was his problem. I mean, there are other issues. He dealt with the whole problem of anti-Semitism that his followers had been largely responsible for in the Labour Party very, very badly uh, and was in denial about it. And that lost us the support of the Jewish community, which had traditionally supported Labour over the generations in much greater numbers than, than the Conservatives. And uh, I said at the time, a few years ago, that we cannot win a general election when an important community like the Jewish community in Britain is condemning us any more than we could have done if the, the Muslim community had condemned us or black Britons had condemned us. Right. Um, so, you know, that was a big problem for under Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. Okay, okay. But um, you've provided so many amazing insights, um, not only on, you know, the South African scenario that the the, uh, the anti-apartheid era, rhino poaching, and even now uh, on, on UK governance. I want to thank you so, so much uh, for your inputs on that. I want to give you a last opportunity to say anything you might want to plug something. Well, it's very kind of you, Beatrice, and I've been delighted to talk to, to you, too, and thank you to Gordon for arranging this as, as well, uh, and good luck with your, your mission. Uh, I have recently had published with my co-author, my great friend from Cape Town, Andre Woodendahl, Professor Woodendahl, uh, my, our book called Pitch Battles, Sport, Racism and Resistance. And that tells the story of the anti-apartheid struggle in sport in a way that um, never has been told before, both the domestic South African end of the struggle and the international campaign, part of which I led uh, through pitch invasions to stop the Springboks playing in 1969-70 and uh, to to stop the cricket tour due in 1970 to England, uh, and that propelled white South Africa international sporting isolation. And it was right that it did so, because if you think back to 1969-70, Danny Craven, who rugby follows in South Africa, will know as the, the rugby guru of the time, 
uh, and a great rugby leader of South Africa, he said, over my dead body will there ever be a black springbok. Oh, really? And, of course, that's what he said in 1969 during our campaign. Well, of course, Sia Khaleesi um, hoisted the, uh, the the Rugby World Cup trophy uh, in, Nove- in, in um, late no- 2019, Vic- those mm-hmm. victorious Springboks who vanquished England, and with, with half the team from, um, from black South Africans who would never have been allowed to play, which is the reason we did that. So that tells the whole story. And then, as you kindly mentioned earlier, and we touched upon my thriller, The Rhino Conspiracy, um, uh, was a political thriller. So it's uh, people say it's an easy and, and, a, and a gripping read. And that's why what I intended it to, to, to tell the story of the betrayal of the Mandela vision uh, of, of an inclusive democratic South Africa into the, the depths of corruption that it fell under President Zuma, former President Zuma. And it allies that story to rhino poaching uh, but it's it's an easy read which you know a political book is not necessarily so uh, but one often final... that's the best way to expose it it's, it's a way to get people interested yeah. it's a story about it they can be passionate about yeah and people have been kind enough and the reviews and and uh, those have read it to say it, it you know it is a, a page turner as one reviewer described it as and that's what i intended i i, I read thrillers when i in my spare time as well so this was my attempt to to write a thriller uh, and it, it got a good reception including in south africa so you know i hope more people will get it to understand the scale of the problem but to do so in a way that's enjoyable and gripping exactly yeah. stories provide you know motivation uh, a really an idea that's even stronger than the concept the problem itself the idea that it generates is actually way more powerful. And it is something that's so very dear to a lot of our South Africans. You know, if there's one thing that we have in common, doesn't matter what, you know, skin color is, doesn't matter what your control is, it's it's our love of our country and our nature and our land and, of course, our animals. Well, um, wildlife, so- you know, and, and the wonderful safari parks that you have in South Africa are, you know, in the DNA of South Africa. They're your heritage. Um, long before, you know, humans populated... South Africa and the numbers that now do, uh, there was wildlife all over and you've got a precious heritage, which has, if, if the country is going to attract the international tourists, you know, uh, when the pandemic is, is, mm. is kind of, I, I never say post pandemic because I'm not yeah. sure there ever will be a post pandemic world that goes back to normal in the sense of pre pandemic. I think we'll find through vaccination and other ways better of managing it, but you need to attract the tourists that, um, come in there thousands and pay a lot of money to visit these wonderful nature reserves and they need protecting and the wildlife is precious in them and it's also part of you know if i'm allowed to the space in this interview to say so it's also linked to the um the climate change emergency the climate emergency we're in the grip of a climate catastrophe and and the interrelationship between the natural world and climate and the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, is very close mm. because it's the destabilization of the ecosystem by voracious humanity, the most destructive animals on world, on the planet are human beings. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, poaching and the protection of our precious wildlife is linked to protecting our climate change and linked to cleaning up our politics and getting a more just um, world which gives everybody a decent chance regardless of their skin color, their politics, their religion, or their background or their income. I mean, that must be the gold standard for us all. And these these issues of wildlife protection and climate change and uh, decent politics are all connected. No, exactly. And their intellect, exactly. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, I just want to say to our viewers, uh, if you believe in what Lord Peter Haynes said, um, please, by all means, like and share this video. It allows the algorithm to share this to as many people as possible. It's exactly what we're trying to do here at Worldview is just get the perspectives out there, get the conversation going. And at that point, hopefully change can happen. So for those of you that have joined it and made it thus far, please, by all means, uh, share this with all your friends and family. Uh, to Peter as well, just thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. So thank you so much for watching. This has been Worldview. Thank you.